Good evening and welcome. My name is Nick Davies and I'm a Programme Director here at the Institute for Government. On behalf of the Institute for Government and the Productivity Institute, thank you very much for joining us for the second event in our new Productivity Pitches series, with today's focus being criminal justice and law enforcement. Productivity in public services has never been more important. Most services are struggling to return to pre-pandemic levels of performance, and both the Conservatives and Labour have indicated that they will stick to tight spending plans after the election. Spending plans that imply cuts for unprotected areas of public spending like criminal justice. Improvements in performance are therefore likely to have to come from frontline workers finding new and innovative ways of delivering services. This series aims to highlight some outstanding examples from the front line, identifying uh, key improvements and lessons that can be shared more widely. Uh, and today we have three fantastic case studies. So first up, we will have Matt Burbeck from the Policing Productivity Team, who will be talking to us about video attendance by the police. He'll be followed by Chantal Hughes and Emma Hazan from Hampton Trust, uh, who will discuss the Cautioning and Relationship Abuse, or CARA, scheme. And our third presentation will be from Dr. Varinda Panasar and Neil Fraser, who will explain the new neurodiversity unit at Pentonville Prison. Each presentation will be up to 10 minutes, uh, with 10 minutes of questions to follow each one. Uh, and then to wrap up, I will be joined by Bart Van Ark, the Managing Director of the Productivity Institute, to discuss some of the common themes from the three presentations. If you have any questions for any of our panellists, uh, please raise your hand during the Q&A session if you are here in person, or if you're watching online, uh, you can submit them uh, at any time, and we'll try to get through as many questions as we can. I'd also encourage you to tweet using hashtag productivity pitches, uh, and we'll also be tweeting from the at IFG events account. Right, without further ado, I'm gonna hand over to Matt Burbeck from the Policing Productivity Team. Uh, good evening. Um, my name is Matt Burbeck. I'm a temporary superintendent on secondment to the police productivity team. Um, and uh, we've been running for uh, coming up uh, 18 months now. Um, we're a, uh, funded by the Home Office, um, supported by the National Police Chiefs Council and led by former Chief Constable Alan Pusley. Um, and the team comprises uh, serving and former police officers, police staff and other subject matter experts. Um, we're working closely with partners in the College of Policing, um, HMI, CFRS, and the other members of the sort of policing family. Um, and as you can see, our, our intention there, try and get the best possible policing service from the resources available, um, identify and deliver tangible improvements to the front line um, by going out and exploring what good practice there is both inside and outside of policing. Um, we've already made recommendations, which is leading to activity to free up over one million officer hours, which can then be reinvested into other challenges like attending domestic abuse and burglary. Um, as I mentioned, we're always looking to capture that best practice and get that shared and how to make best use of it, and also science and technology and what needs to be done there to improve the service in policing. And then, of course, the kind of key, key aim is how can we ingrain that productivity culture into policing. So one of the examples we found when seeking good practice is RVR, um, video, uh, video attendance, essentially, at incidents. So the challenge um, faced by you know, almost all emergency public services and many others, I'm sure, that demand versus resource. In our particular case in policing, it's always calls for service versus the available officers and staff that might be there to, to go to it. We need to make best use of technology available to us and also best use of our limited duties officers. Um, so that is those officers that are not available to carry out full duties. Maybe they're injured, maybe they have a disability. Um, so how can we use them to the best effect? And then we also know uh, from numbers of studies that timeliness is key to justice. Um, the quicker that we can capture evidence, the quicker we intervene, the quicker we hold the offenders to account, prevent reoffending, and safeguard the victims. But there are cultural barriers to doing this um, within policing, and I'm sure other public services. We're often trying to seek perfection um, at the cost of effectiveness. Um, and of course, perfect becomes the enemy of good. Um, are we comfortable failing con conventionally um, rather than taking that risk to try and do something different? Um, I've managed to, oh, that's someone else. <laughs> and um, 
do we always adopt good practice from elsewhere, um, both within policing and looking outside? Um, how effective are we are at looking outside and borrowing with pride? Nonetheless, RVR is a good example. Um, it's relatively simple. The call for service comes into the control room. Um, in this particular case, um, specifically domestic abuse incidents, um, and the call gets transferred, just as with all calls, to a dispatcher, except at this point the dispatcher looks for whether this is appropriate to be dealt with by video attendance rather than physical attendance. Um, they carry out a risk assessment. Clearly, if the offender is still present, that would not be suitable. That requires physical attendance. Um, but also, what are the vulnerabilities of the person calling in? Um, what are their preferences? If they don't want to do it, they don't do it, and they go on to the normal physical attendance. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, and do they have the technical capabilities to accept the video call? And if it is appropriate, it's then passed for the rapid video response, and it's passed to an officer um, who has access to the right technology, and they literally they send a link to the victim who clicks on it, and bam, they're now having video attendance with the officer. Of course, what was happening in the business as usual is that you would wait for physical attendance. And because the offender is not present, this isn't an emergency call, so we will get to you when we can, when the resources are available. So it's not immediate. By video, it is immediate. The initial response, sorry, the initial findings were all incredibly positive, and I, I would argue probably above what anyone was expecting. Um, they did a randomized control trial um, initially. Uh, and then they've obviously done further evaluation um, since, as the program's been rolled out kind of more coherently. And these are some of the key findings. Uh, there was also the secondary benefit that they're not geogra geographically constrained. So when you get um, bulges in demand in a certain district, say a major instance happening, then that obviously dramatically lengthens attendance times. Doesn't happen with RVR, um, even just you know the Friday afternoon traffic uh, around a certain area. None of that's impacted. Um, the arrest rate, significantly higher, and that led to positive justice outcomes further down the line. So 20% improvement in the charge rate um, and 20% improvement in positive outcomes for those individuals who were taken to court. Um, it also found, was found to prevent 25% failure demand from the relevant incidents, um, which would be those individuals ringing in to chase attendance. Um, because, of course, when they sit into the business as usual, um, not, you can't guarantee when that physical attendance turns up. Um, and then, of course, the satisfaction rate, most importantly. I guess the most important thing from a public service is this is also what the public want. Um, not in every case, of course, only when it's appropriate and only when they are seeking it. But there are lots of benefits to them um, that maybe we uh, previously, as police, hadn't considered. Ooh. So what next? Um, they're reviewing um, where it can be expanded into, and they think potentially up to 23%. As I said previously, it was only domestic abuse. Um, potentially up to 23% of incidents could be appropriate for RVR um, if, of course, all of those conditions are met. You know, the risk assessment, the vulnerability, the access to technology, um, and the willingness of the, uh, of the victim. Um, of course, in policing, um, we can expand our video engagement to other areas of business apart from attendance, um, right to know, um, applications from individuals who want to know whether the, the person they're in a relationship with um, has a domestic abuse history, for example, um, doesn't necessarily need to be done with physical attendance. Um, using the quality of the video that's captured as evidence, um, the video is better because it's more stable than body-worn video, which is conventionally worn by attending officers. Um, there's, in the current process, we capture video through attendance but we then write written MG11 statements from victims. Is there an opportunity to use this video evidence instead of the paper evidence that the MG11s, is it better primary evidence? And that's being explored with the CPS. There are opportunities to improve the flexibility to resource the teams. At the moment, they're dedicated teams, but the training only takes 15 minutes to use the technology. So if officers are only briefly injured, rather than removing them from frontline duties, can they remain, but just access the systems and start attending incidents remotely. Um, and, uh, and of course, how can we more quickly roll out both RVR and other systems like this? Um, the Southeast region uses blueprints um, where one force trials a new innovation technology like RVR, writes the blueprint so all the policies, all the information sharing agreements, all of that's completed with it. And that can then be picked up by another force so they don't have to relearn um, all of the same things, the scripts, the decisions around how you allocate and who you, uh, who you ask to come with it. Um, 
lots and lots of forces um, are now exploring this. Um, approximately 33, we believe, are either rolling it out or intending to um, out of the 43 in England and Wales. Um, and two forces from America have contacted um, British forces asking about this to see if it's appropriate for them as well. However, we always have to try and uh, ensure that we don't risk accidentally creating another layer of attendance. So we can roll this out more effectively, um, but the risk is always that we actually increase the quality, which when we have resources, of course we should do, and that those opportunities shouldn't be missed when we can do it, but the risk that we add that other layer and you end up with a call, then the video attendance, then the physical attendance, and you end up actually reintroducing some duplicated effort. So we have to be mindful always of that. <clears throat> so could it be rolled out elsewhere or what lessons did we learn that, that could be learned by other agencies? Um, are there opportunities in, in your public service to provide the right answer first time for service users? Um, improve the timeliness, prevent the failure demand, stop driving places you don't need to necessarily drive to. Um, clearly there are always technological opportunities um, and there must be numerous processes that can be used with relatively simple solutions like this. Um, <coughs> doubtless some of those cultural barriers that, that make it difficult for police sometimes to explore those, those options will exist. Legal, safe, ethical concerns about public perception of what we're doing. Um, and uh, clearly on to other cultural barriers around that being comfortable to fail conventionally and so on, um, and not adopt practices from other agencies. And finally, can you evaluate it? Um, it's all very well rolling out these efficiency uh, drives, but if we're not evaluating it to make sure there isn't an unintended consequence, such as increased harm or a failure, in our case it would have been around the justice outcomes or reduction in the justice outcomes, then how do you ensure you protect against that? That is rapid video response. Brilliant, thank you very much. Um, please come and take a seat. Thank you. Um, I'm <laughs> Um, I'm going to open up to questions in a minute, but I've just got a couple of questions of my own um, first. Um, you mentioned a couple of times uh, the importance of access to the right technology. Does it require any kind of specialist IT software or hardware? And, and what are the upfront costs associated with implementing this? Um, so I mean, the reality is there are lots of technological opportunities. Um, examples like Microsoft Teams and Zoom are all entirely feasible for it. Um, I think in criminal justice environment, um, there is an argument that you might want some additional um, protections around that. Um, you know, as a public sector, we obviously have to purchase um, from uh, uh, companies that can provide certain levels of protect data protection and so on. Um, and, but of course, some of them are more expensive than others. There are licensing challenges. Um, and it's fair to say, uh, you know, making best use of small number of licenses to get that most efficient use out of them is, is another kind of cost. But if you compare that to the cashable savings of, of just simple uh, petrol and driving around and then obviously officer time, which wouldn't be a cashable saving because you'd reinvest that. But nonetheless, um, you can make the financial argument uh, for um, access to the relevant systems. And you mentioned a couple of times also uh, kind of cultural challenges or uh, kind of as barriers to wider implementation. Can you say a bit more about what those cultural challenges are? I think um, there's if you've got an extensive history showing what works, um, you know, type of thing, you know, um, so for example, we know physical attendance to capture evidence and safeguard victims works. Um, that would be the conventional, um, the conventional way we respond. But as that demand challenges our resources and we look for that alternative way to do things, I think there's always a fear of, of coming away from that conventional response, um, even though we, it's no longer with the resources we have sufficient to achieve what we're trying to achieve, or it's just not achieving it as swiftly as, as an alternative way. And so I think there's, there's just a fear of adopting that, um, adopting those risky new ways, um, which is again the importance of evaluating as you go. And, and I mean, in this particular case, the use of a randomized control trial um, to show that, you know, to, to kind of, um, to show that really helped. I think the, um, Sorry, I'll stop there. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say, and, and in terms of the kind of the reluctance or the, or the worry about doing things def differently, is that kind of uniform across different levels or is it more seen at the kind of PCC or chief constable level or the kind of middle management or the kind of sergeants and constables? 
I mean, I, I, would, I would suspect that um, decision makers will, will always be concerned if they're the ones that have direct interactions with um, community safety groups, partners, um, and other media, I guess. I guess that would be where probably the, um, the kind of concern would come from. Um, rather than the frontline practitioners, because they're probably less aware. And I would argue, in an example like RVR, they probably have regular interactions with members of the public who may be asking, why is technology like this not being used? Great. I'm going to open it up to some questions from the audience. So if you have a question, can you please put your hand up? Uh, a mic, can you wait till the mic comes to you? Can you say what your name is? And please, 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 can you make sure it is a question and not a long statement, because we don't have a huge amount of time. Um, so I'm going to go to the, I think there are two gentlemen there who wanted to ask a question. So we'll take those two together and then this one here as well. Hi, uh, Neil Carmichael. Uh, fascinating. I'm sorry I arrived a little bit late. You may have answered this question already, but you said halfway through that there are 43 um, constabularies. Is that too many uh, for um, the task in hand, which is to increase productivity um, and effectiveness uh, ac uh, across the country? I think I'm correct in saying that, broadly speaking, the structure we now have was created in 1964. Uh, we are now 2024. Perhaps it's time for at least regional structures rather than uh, 43 constabularies. Great, thank you. And to the the gentleman next to you. Yeah, I am Tom Pope, also from the Institute for Government. Um, it's interesting in the, um, in the outcomes from the con randomized control trial, which are obviously really impressive. Um, so two related questions. One is, how often does a video call then still need to be followed up with a, an in-person call? And I suppose the question there is, how much is this sort of a genuine saving of time versus an improved quality of, of mm. service? And then related to that, what is the key driver of the higher charge rates? Is it that you're getting evidence that you weren't getting at all, or just that you're getting it more quickly and therefore it's higher quality? Brilliant, thank you. And then um, final question, uh, lady at the front. I hope you're keeping that. <laughs> <laughs> Penelope <coughs> Gibbs from Transform Justice. So on normal domestic abuse calls, when the police go and judge has been a crime, in 50% of cases, the alleged victim refuses to cooperate. That's in all the stats. Mm. How does that translate through on this? Do those people not just not be willing to take the call or what? Thank you very much. So we've got that um, final question there on uh, the proportion of those who uh, are spoken to by video who are willing to provide evidence. We had the question um, from Neil whether we have too many police forces uh, to be productive. And then the kind of the double question uh, from Tom about whether the video call is actually saving time, just providing a better service. And then also, and it's a question we had online as well about why it's leading to higher charge rates. Um, so I guess the, the member of the public, uh, where there's a domestic incident and they don't make contact with police, um, they clearly, they don't fall into this category because they won't have made the contact. Where they do make the contact, that sense, that's right, that's right. Yeah. So, where, and so where they do make contact, if they're appropriate for the RVR process and they're referred across, and then this licks into the same question about what happens next. Because it's all being videoed and it's happening much closer to the incident um, than the conventional attendance. Remember, these are not the emergency incidents where it's ongoing. These are the ones where it's, it might have happened very, you know, very imminently, but, but it's not happening right now. So you don't get that immediate attendance. Um, police officers attend, well, I mean, as you saw from the data, they can arrive within an hour, but the cold reality is, in general, they arrive much, much later. Um, that willingness for the victim, that may reduce over time. Um, in general, there is quite a bit of evidence around timeliness and justice in general leads to victim and witness um, disengagement from the server, you know, from what it, from the process that's going on. So you're capturing them at their most open, you might argue, because it was the moment they reached out for help, not an hour later when they've considered things, considered, who knows, the risk to them potentially. All sorts of other things can happen at that point. Um, the second thing is, often if the incident's just occurred, there is evidence of the incident, physical bruising to the individual, damage that's occurred within the property. 
um, especially where a person's trashed the house, to use a sort of classic example. Once the officers arrive three to four hours later in business as usual, it's not unusual for the victim to have tidied up. It's entirely natural that you'd want to do that um, within your own living space. But what has happened, of course, is we've lost evidence. Um, so we believe um, that that timeliness um, not only encourages the support because you've captured the person at the, per at the time they were the most open to seeking that support, but secondly, you've captured the best evidence that you can on video, which that slow, any min every minute of delay, arguably, we're starting to lose both that potential victim support and uh, the evidence, and that's probably what's leading to those positive outcomes, we think. A couple of other questions. How often does it require the Tom's question about how often are follow-ups, in-person follow-ups required? Yes, I mean, in all fairness, I'm getting, I'm getting my data from teams that are they're going to want to be uh, positive. They were capturing the volumes of hours that they were saving business as usual by attending it. Um, I'm afraid I don't have specific numbers. Um, they are, they were, they're obviously quite keen to highlight those events where the information then changes. Um, so uh, the suspect re-enters the scene, or the suspect is at scene, and in fact the information has been not passed through. Um, so for example, maybe the suspect was outside, but the person on the video can say, look, he's there. Um, they capture that evidence, which helps with all of the outcomes further down and support, but yeah, then they do, of course, then deploy a physical attendance in, as an emergency, and, um, and I'm afraid I don't have the statistics. But they are a very, very small number. Um, similarly, there will be occasions where the person's more vulnerable than was previously assessed, maybe, and, and that might require a physical attendance. And it's worth saying this is only that initial attendance bit. There's still the requirement to allocate the investigation where there's a secondary investigation. None of that changes. And similarly, the arrest of the offender when it needs to be allocated, um, you know, none of that is saved by the RVR. It's only that initial attendance saving. And then just finally, has the productivity, the police productivity uh, team looked at the question of whether there are too many forces? Uh, we didn't look specifically at um, the question of, of how, uh, I guess, operational delivery of the organisations operationally deliver policing. Um, we're very conscious, however, one of the strengths of the 43 force model is that it allows innovation like this to occur because each of them have their operational independence. The challenge, though, if you're going to have um, a wide variety able to take that innovation option is how do we make sure they're capturing and sharing that across and how do we ensure that they are sharing as much as they can, um, especially a smaller organisation, you know, smaller forces, uh, how can they band together to make best use of technology and have the biggest buying power with, with private sector and so on. So we didn't look specifically at reorganising the operational element, but we did look at how could, how could the forces both share and work together more effectively to be more productive. Fantastic, thank you. Well, with that, um, I'm going to bring this first presentation to close. Matt, thank you very much. Thank I think there'll be lots of questions afterwards. Uh, so and now I'm going to introduce up onto the <coughs> stage uh, Chantal Hughes and Emma Hazan uh, from the Hampton Trust. Hello. Um, thank you for inviting me to this event. Um, my name is Chantal Hughes. I'm the CEO of Hampton Trust. Um, I'm trying to condense what's been kind of a 10, 11 year project I've been involved in to 10 minutes. So what I'm going to do is try and give you some key headlines and something that I think is kind of relevant to um, innovation and replication. OK, so. Um, is the next slide? Oh, I'm going the wrong way. Sorry. <laughs> so. Um, I've been involved in the design and the delivery of Project CARA since 2011. Um, I work in, Ham in Southampton with Hampshire and Isle of Wight Constabulary. And I was fortunate that Hampshire Constabulary, as we, you know, they were very forward thinking and very innovative at that time in terms of um, kind of looking at ways that they could address domestic abuse. Um, what they recognised is in the preceding year, at the time they started to kind of think about alternative methods, they were given out something like 1,500 simple cautions. And it was felt that, you know, they felt that this wasn't a satisfactory response to domestic abuse, particularly for the victims and survivors involved. They felt that actually they could do better. Um, it felt that um, in giving out simple cautions, um, those offenders that caused in harm in relationships weren't being held accountable. So, um, so they brought a stakeholder group together, made up of kind of um, criminal justice board, crime prosecution. Importantly, the defence lawyers were involved, um, the police, 
um, third sector. And, um, and I was fortunate to be invited to that as a Hampton Trust um, provider that was working with offenders and have been for several years. Um, what we did at that time is I worked very closely with the victim services to actually hold some focus groups and talk to the victims and survivors that had experienced domestic abuse and ask them what they felt would be a, an enhanced criminal justice response, what they felt would be better for them. And, um, and consistently what we heard was they just wanted somebody to speak to their partner or their ex-partner about their behaviour. And it was felt that um, a simple caution or no further action or even, even if you kind of go up to the next level and look at sort of attendance at court, that still nobody was having those conversations. So in my um, naivety, and um, there was a lot of naivety on my part, what I said is that's okay. Um, you know, I'd heard people talk about diversionary kind of um, options and conditional cautions. I said, well, why don't we just offer a conditional caution? They said, no, Chantal, um, it's not that simple. What we have to do is we have to get special permission. And we were very, very fortunate at that time. That, um, and it's been a huge surprise this evening to see Larry Sherman and Heather Strong here that were involved in the Cambridge Randomised Control Trial. And, um, and I think what happened is because there was a willingness to trial something different, it gave us some weight for the Chief Constable to get to apply for special permission from the DPP and to look at how we could trial something that offered conditional cautions for domestic abuse perpetrators that met a certain eligibility criteria. Um, and that's what we did. I mean, we had to wait some nine or ten months to get permission. There was lots and lots of discussions on the design of it. We knew that we had 16 weeks in which to look at an intervention because that's, um, that's all we have um, when we issue a conditional caution. Um, and so what we did is we devised two workshops. Um, I wanted to allow a month apart, um, a reflection period to look at the offence. And, um, and kind of we did that um, for two or three years um, under randomised control trial conditions. Um, and in between those two sessions, what is a really important part of this process is that there's contact made with the victim and survivor because there's lots of them that remain in relationships. Um, there was lots of other things in the background. People were thinking that actually it was an alternative to long-term perpetrator work, and it certainly isn't. This is suitable for a certain level of offender. And importantly, what we're doing is we're raising awareness and we're trying to signpost and engage them into longer-term services. So, um, so that's what we did. Um, when the, when the um, trial finished, this is the results up here that, um, that you can see in terms of the reduction in reoffending. And then there was an appetite from other police forces that were keen to actually also trial it in their areas. Um, and the Home Office and the MOJ at that time, what they said is um, they were very cautious, um, particularly around domestic abuse and conditional cautions. Um, so what they said is, subject to using similar principles, they kind of cited it as CARA principles, they were quite happy for forces to apply um, to, be, to pilot it in their area. And so um, that was a really good opportunity for us to look at, could we replicate that success in other police forces with different demographics? And, and there's 43 police forces, and I've, I've learned um, over the sort of years of working that actually they all operate quite differently. Um, so we did, we have trialled it in other areas, and we've had similar results. Um, in June, Hampshire and Stabbury did their own internal insights, which is up there, and then... Um, Birmingham University carried out an evaluation quite recently in 2021, and we're currently part of a multi-site evaluation with our three forces, with our eight forces that are part of that. What we recognised is that there's still an appetite for replication, and for me, as a charity and as a third sector provider, there's a limit to what I wanted to do in terms of direct delivery. So it was how could we work with partners and other areas to get them to commission their local providers to actually take it to the next level. And Emma will talk to you about how we've developed CARA now, that it's a mix of we directly deliver it in the existing sites, but we're enabling other providers in other areas to work with the police and deliver in those areas. Oh, that's some, thing. That's some kind of a quote from um, an attendee. Yeah. This um, quote is quite indicative of some of the feedback that we received from the offenders, but we've also, since rolling out the replication model, have seen a lot of, thank you, um, positive impact and positive feedback from providers that are now delivering CARA um, in areas uh, where Hampton Trust have 
supported and developed the skills and knowledge and experience for them to lead on car delivery with those new force areas. Um, but how we got there was a bit of trial and error. Um, so we were approached by a local organization that was interested in bringing CARA to a new area. And we hadn't delivered CARA um, with a different provider before. It had always been us, so we had been building in our own sort of internal agency knowledge and experience. Um, and so with this trial, we were able to build what, um, I guess, a manual that incorporates a lot of the questions that we hadn't necessarily anticipated would come up, both for the police and also so that these new providers would be able to follow on um, to ensure that CARA remains safe and effective. So the conversations that are needed, the checks that are needed, the mobilization planning, um, establishing scrutiny panels, what the conversations need to be looking like. And so with that, we have, oh, sorry. There we go. Um, we've developed what we think is quite a replicable model in terms of uh, CARA delivery. So with this, we know that there are police forces that are interested in looking at addressing domestic abuse early on. Um, they're also looking for local providers so that um, the organization has a local understanding, um, facilitators that already have worked either in the area or with the organization themselves and have those skills and experience, knowledge around domestic abuse. Um, and we've populated what we think are quite robust uh, mobilization documents and guidance. Um, we deliver the training. We provide the quality assurance and we provide sort of ongoing support in the lead up to commissioning a service in the mobilization and planning of the delivery and still involved when the delivery is ongoing to ensure that it remains replicable, safe and effective. Um, a lot of the support is ad hoc, but a lot of it is also formalized in meetings that then go on to um, ensure that there's a consistency when inevitably there's, you know, role changes or um, updates in legislation, all of that stuff. So, yeah, um, I think that's, oh, no, sorry, there we go. <laughs> so um, if there's any questions. Perfect, thank you. Um, so you mentioned that um, it's currently used, I think, is it in nine areas or eight areas? Um, we d it's in nine areas that we directly deliver. And um, our first opportunity was in West Yorkshire with a new provider. And we're now in the... How many sites have you just mobilised it? Um, so I think there's eight areas where Hampton Trust deliver. And then um, within a month, there will be seven areas there where there's a replication model. And are there, are there, you said that you needed kind of uh, special permission uh, in order to mm -hmm. do this. Is that a kind of barrier to more widespread rollout? It has been in the past. Yeah. Um, there is an sort of incoming legislation um, that has been delayed because it's part of a bigger piece of work within policing. But uh, eventually that won't be. Um, we were expecting it to be sooner, but we're... It, it's we're fairly waiting. timely, actually, because we've been waiting for the... It was the out-of-court disposal framework, uh, it's now the out-of-court resolutions. We've been waiting for the policy reform that's got pushed back. It's still now being pushed back, supposedly, to 2025, but we have heard that there's been permission for forces to use conditional cautions for domestic abuse for all forces, actually, we've heard this week. So it is pretty hot off the press at the moment that after years and years of forces coming and asking, how could we, I help them get permission or what do they need to do? It has been a waiting game and now they can actually look at something but there are still strict eligibility criteria there's strict guidance and strict principles they can't actually necessarily just go and do it for anything they need to follow the the kind of the guidelines mm -hmm. in which to do so mm -hmm. great i'm going to open up to questions from the audience again uh, so we have a gentleman here if you could wait until the microphone gets to you gentleman here and then lady behind uh, and then gentleman at the back Fantastic. That's a great presentation. Richard Price, sorry, I should have said from Ministry of Justice. Uh, could you say a little bit more about the barriers to, um, to scaling this up? I mean, you mentioned that uh, I'd be very, I couldn't quite work out who you needed special permission from, so it'd be very interesting yeah. to hear that. But yeah. also, given the scale of the payback, uh, I mean, how, how good are we at, you know, in general across the public sector at promulgating lessons on what works and how, uh, how well do you think those benefits are understood across, 
across policing in particular, I suppose. But it's interesting the barriers to scaling up. Perfect, thank you. And then uh, to the lady, a uh, couple of rows behind you. Hi there, Maura Wallace. Um, I'm interested in um, who or what is the replication engine. So are you the replication engine? Um, should there, you know, are you doing that from a local area because you thought it up and you've developed it? Do you need more support from the center? Could someone else copy your ideas and start uh, rolling them out? Would you mind? So uh, I'm interested in, in all that, sort of how this spreads and do you own it? Do you want to own it? Perfect. And then a uh, gentleman at the back, and then I think we'll probably quickly slip a question in for Bart as well. Hi, my name is Lawrence Morris. Um, I was interested, if I saw them correctly, the differences between Hampshire and Southampton, because the key indicator for productivity is the repeats, the level of repeats. And the level of repeats in Hampshire, I think, were much lower. You had more success in Hampshire than in Southampton. So I'm interested in what do you think are the reasons for that, if I've, if I've, if I've interpreted your figures correctly, because they were difficult to see from the back. Perfect, thank you. And then one final question um, from Bart. Yeah, very quick, I want to probe a little bit more on the productivity gain of this. There's one number in your presentation of a cost benefit of one pound to one pound in 277, five pound out, which is good. But the question is, is it at the end of the day more pounds or less pounds? So where do you make the productivity gain? Is it mainly on the outcome side or are you also mainly, uh, uh, making gains on the input side, the amount of resources you need to get this done? Perfect, thank you. So, uh, four really good questions. So from Bart, where do, is the financial benefit uh, realised? Uh, from Lawrence, uh, what are the causes of the difference in performance uh, between two areas? Uh, from Moira, what is the replication engine uh, for this? Uh, and from uh, Richard, what are the kind of wider barriers to roll out? Okay. So in terms of the cost benefit, uh, Birmingham kind of have been the, the evaluators that have looked at that. And I know that there has been that there was a difference um, in terms of the cost benefit when they looked at two sites, which were the West Midlands and Hampshire. And, um, and I have actually gone back to them to kind of, because what I don't want to do is misquote them. Um, they, they have used the crime economic and social tool in which to do it. In terms of cost, that, what I would say, the, the, the real cost of delivery, it, it is around £250 per offender. So I guess what we need to look at is the cost of policing domestic abuse and the likelihood of, of those offenders sort of reoffending further down the system. And if they don't reoffend, what services might they be accessing? But um, I think in terms of what I can do after this is provide much more detail on that, but I don't want to misquote a researcher. OK, and to the other ones, uh, barriers to roll out, what's the replication yeah. engine and the difference in performance? Yeah. The barriers to roll out were, were, were absolutely around the fact that, that forces were just not permitted to use conditional cautions. Why were they not? Um, I can't actually give you the answer as to why. I think that is, um, people are very, I don't know, I think the MOJ and Department of Public Prosecutions are very, very nervous around domestic abuse and also hate crime. Hate crime was another one. There was a trial of the use of out-of-court um, disposals in 2014 and three sites signed up to that and we hoped on the back of that it would move things along but it, it, it didn't materialise. And we've just waited and waited and waited. And, um, and it, it has been 10, 11 years in, in the making. And I, I, think, so I think CARA attracts, it's a bit like Marmite. I think people are, obvious, are either very pro it and they think it's a good intervention or what they think it's a soft option. And actually what you need to do is prosecute. But actually these, you know, it's about a proportionality and it's around actually mm -hmm. these are offenders that would not make it through CPS in terms of kind of in the public interest. So that, that's where that is. But I think we're at a turning point now. Mm -hmm. um, difference in performance and replication engine. I think so in terms of the replication, we're looking at not just, um, you know, the model of identifying offenders and then passing them on to an intervention. It's what is the uh, conversation happening, the communication between the police and the offender at the point where it's offered. Um, the communication with the offender at the point where the referral is received, how they're received in the session, the, the content, the structure, um, you know, the model in terms of timing. And so that as a whole, including how it sits within the police and the provider, is all part of a, a, the model that we have developed as the sort of 
um, <coughs> licensed version of Cara that is almost identical to how we deliver it ourselves and is informed by all of that. We didn't invent working with offenders and there's a lot of tools that are used that are quite commonly used across any work with offenders. It's how it's delivered. And I've just come back from delivering with some facilitators where they're familiar with the tools, but how we deliver it in Cara was quite new to them. And so we did a lot of work around how that is delivered in the structure and so on. So. Can I just that, use that point to come in with a question from online which uh, relates to that, which was, how do you ensure that new non-Hampton providers identify the right perpetrators? Uh, women allegedly suffer 30 incidents of domestic abuse uh, before they complain, so long-established perpetrators mm -hmm. may appear as new entrants. Mm -hmm. Those questions are raised a lot, and that is around um, kind of, uh, work, you know, <laughs> ensuring that the providers are working closely with, with police leads and partners in the force who are leading um, domestic abuse and out of court disposals because we know that. Um, we've got a strict eligibility <laughs> criteria, and it's about kind of working closely with the police to look at the risk assessment tools they're using. Um, it, we can be as robust as, as we would like to be, but there are always cases where actually police are going to kind of um, assess things and can only go, obviously, on what they're hearing from the victims and the information they have to hand. We do have scrutiny panels, which are really, really important, and we are very vocal if we think that somebody's come on that is not suitable, we immediately refer it. Um, and then we can pick that up as police training and improving practice and responses. So that's something that we're continuing to kind of um, pay close attention to. Can, can I just add to that, yeah. that I think actually embedded within the whole model is the collaborative oversight yeah. so that there is essentially an ongoing risk assessment. It's extending the oversight on the offender, the victim, to respond to any challenges. Domestic abuse risk fluctuates, you know, so we need to be mindful of that. And the facilitator, it's incorporated in the delivery is to be all of those flags that you might pick up where somebody's responding in a certain way. And it's responded contact to contact as well in between helps. Absolutely. And then just finally on that question on it, if you have any thoughts on what the causes of the difference in performance uh, in the two evaluations. Mm. Um, I, I'm, I, forgive me, but I'm not sure I understood the difference between Southampton and Hampshire, because it was one... I'm not sure you had Southampton yeah. evaluation and then you had a Hampshire evaluation. Uh, OK, the internal one versus the oh, randomised yes. control trial. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, so that might be a methodological yeah. issue as yeah. much as yeah. anything else. Yeah, okay. it was a police insights data, so actually I wouldn't be able to kind of speak to that. I'm sorry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. Well, that has brought us to the end of time, and that was incredibly insightful. Thank you very Thank much. You. For our third and final presentation will be from Dr. Varinda Panasar and Neil Fraser, who will explain the new neurodiversity unit at Pentonville Prison. to sit down. <laughs> okay. okay. Hi, everyone, and thanks for having us. So Neil and I are here to <clears throat> share the story of G1, which is one landing in HMP Pentonville. So this is a story of a culture shift in a small pocket of Pentonville, which is a large, old Victorian prison that can hold up to 1,300 prisoners on remand. So if you found yourself in Pentonville under His Majesty's pleasure, you would start off on the induction wing. And unless you were detoxing or in a crisis with your mental health, you would move to one of five main wings in the prison. So before G1 existed, there was no specialist provision for prisoners with diagnoses like autism, ADHD, intellectual disabilities, or communication needs. So I'll take you back to three years ago, before G1 existed, and tell you about one young man's time in Pentonville that started us on this change journey. Let's call him Jay. Jay was a 21-year-old who'd had a difficult upbringing. He was a looked-after child who was born with fetal alcohol syndrome. He was initially adopted with his brother, but placed back into care while his brother remained in the adopted family. While Jay was in Pentonville, his brother sadly took his own life. So in addition to the traumatic experiences, Jay also had significant expressive language difficulties. This meant that he struggled to communicate effectively, which made relationships extremely difficult. His behavior would escalate 
because he couldn't engage in a conversation with staff to negoti negotiate or resolve something. As a result of this, he spent time in the care or separation unit, or more informally known as the segregation block. Significant effort went into supporting Jay. Our speech and language therapist worked with the governor of the segregation unit and the managing chaplain to help Jay while he was in Pentonville. However, it didn't feel like enough to meet his needs in the prison. And it wasn't just Jay. We know that neurodiversity was prevalent in the prison population. So imagine being Jay in HMP Pentonville, having to navigate a chaotic, rigid, uncertain, and inconsistent environment, overloaded by sensory stimuli. Imagine being one of 80 prisoners being looked after by two officers. It's likely that prison officers will not know that you're struggling because you withdraw, or they will see that you're struggling in the form of aggression, violence, or self-harm, but they don't understand what's driving this, and they don't know how to help you effectively. After Jay's transfer, those who had supported him reflected on what more we could do for prisoners like Jay. That initial reflection became a multidisciplinary working group with seven of us. Our goal was to open a small landing with dedicated and trained officers who had time to build relationships with neurodiverse prisoners, to get to know their life stories, to understand the person behind the behavior. We wanted the landing to be an adapted environment. We wanted a therapeutic regime and a personalized approach where you're not just a number. We also wanted prison officers to be looked after because we know you can't be expected to look after the most risky and vulnerable members of our society without being looked after yourself. So the seven of us met weekly for 18 months, drinking tea, thinking, planning, creating, looking at resources. How were we going to identify prisoners with these needs? How were healthcare and prison staff going to work together? How were we, how were we going to recruit the right prison officers and support and upskill them? And how are we going to protect G1 from going back to older ways of working? This had never been done in a remand jail, so we didn't have a template to work from. We were patient and committed. We needed to be because things rarely go to plan in a prison. Old pipes and cockroaches delayed our opening day twice. We also persevered because key NHS and prison publications around the time were recommending the very things we planned to implement, so it felt like we were on the right track. It wasn't all smooth, though, as we faced barriers. Not everyone was bought in. We didn't have any additional funding. And there were concerns that G1 would become a dumping ground for the most complex guys, or it would become a soft teddy bear wing that allows prisoners to get away with bad behavior. But I think we're doing well overall. Um, the landing has been open for 18 months, and our initial data is positive. I'll hand over to Neil to say a bit more about G1 from a prison operational perspective. But before that, I wanted to share a quote that I think is really relevant to those of us working in the criminal justice system, trying to bring about change. I don't know who said this, but here's the quote. At the edges of human endeavor, where threat is high, no single person, system, or organization has or is the answer. It's messy. It's supposed to be messy. Those who perform best acknowledge their vulnerability embrace the mess, and work together to be less messy than the rest. That was me. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I've been working at Pentaville for nearly 14 years now, um, and I didn't have a clue what neurodiversity was. Um, I didn't understand autism, dyslexia, ADHD, learning difficulties, that kind of thing. Those kind of prisoners were a drain on resources. They were just someone who's getting in the way of us delivering the, the regime on a day-to-day -day basis. So once I became one of the seven, I started understanding what the, these kind of uh, needs were for the, for the prisoners. And what we've done on G1 is we've, we've got uh, 50 beds, 45 prisoners down there at the moment, um, and apart from three uh, who are are my red bands, I've got 42 people with a diagnosis of autism, ADHD, 
dementia, um, learning difficulties, that kind of thing. So all of those, those guys would be on normal location in a normal prison, um, causing havoc. They'd be on an act, which is a uh, suicide watch, self-harm watch. Uh, they'd be smashing cells up. They'd be uh, attacking staff, all that kind of thing. Downstairs, now on G1, because it it's down in the basement, um, we are the only one in the prison service that's got a unit like this. There's a couple of other smaller units, um, but we're the only remand local prison um, in the country that's got this, this unit. So let's say we've got uh, 45 prisoners yesterday that we had. Um, our staff to prisoner ratio is slightly higher, so we can um, help the prisoners with um, their day-to-day -day needs. We do silly little things, which I thought were silly little things when, when I first started doing them. We give them earplugs. We knock on the door to say we're coming in. We uh, give them J cloths instead of scouring pads to clean their plates. Um, we try to be a, have it quieter. We're, we're actually the, the basement landing of the biggest wing in Europe. So it's quite difficult to keep the noise down. But we have a, a dog that comes in every Tuesday, a, a therapy dog called Dobby. He's the star of the show, really, but he's, Dobby comes in. We have uh, OT, specialist OT sessions. We have one-to-one -one sessions. We have speech and language therapists. We have ADHD doctors occasionally come down and, and see us. <laughs> We've got um, sessions of yoga. We've got uh, art classes, we, all this kind of thing that these guys, if they were on normal location, wouldn't be going to. They would not be doing it because they'd be in their 8 by 12 cell, overstimulated, uh, self-harming, um, like I say, attacking staff, smashing cell. At the moment, out of those 45 prisoners, I've got no one on an act. There's not one person who is uh, self-harming down there. I'm not saying we haven't had, but because of the way the staff are treating them, the way the staff, because the staff have got slightly more time to look after the, to give them, show, help them with their needs. Um, so it's, it's been a massive success. Um, we think it has. The only thing we've, we, we want to do is, is try and increase the, the level of support that we get from all round, not just the, the, the uh, um, healthcare side, but the, the prison side as well. Um, and I'll just leave you with one quote from a prisoner who sent this into there's a, a national newspaper called the Inside Times within, for the prison service. And Stephen wrote this. The NDU has been a complete game changer. The availability of help and the range of support has been astonishing. The timetable is full and fair and all are catered for. I'd like to thank the staff because one day at a time they are changing lives. Thank you very much. have any sort of like uh, stats on the key indicators uh, like the difference this has made to things like uh, violence or self-harm? Not this, this is one of the things I want to try and get because we haven't really got we've had a little data um, analysis but um, we haven't got it in writing like down on paper but it's the self-harm is virtually nil down on the, on the landing violence well, yesterday, we had nine incidents of violence yesterday in the main prison. We didn't have any on G1. We, we very, very rarely. We do have them. But um, like I say, because of the way the staff interact with the prisoners, they've got a little bit more time and their needs are getting met. Things like getting their phone numbers on or getting their money sorted out. On the normal wings, they haven't got that. And, and if you've got autism or ADHD, you're expecting that to get done now and not three days' time. So we tend to get everything done a lot quicker. And you mentioned you've had um, no additional funding. Can you therefore say a bit more about how you've managed to resource the additional training for staff, the higher staff ratios, and some of the additional <coughs> services it sounds like you're offering as well? The seven have done it. <laughs> um, Verinda and these guys here have, have done uh, all the training for us. Um, apart from we had one external, we had an autism bus which comes in, we've had that two or three times. 
um, which gives you an autism experience, which I highly recommend everyone who hasn't got autism to go and do it. I wouldn't recommend anyone who has got autism to go in there. It's a little bit, it's, it's very stimulating. Um, but you guys, they don't give it, their, their time is within their, your own curriculum sort of thing. You build it into coming to help we, us. We, we thought creatively about how we would use the existing resource um, so that G1 got enough time and attention in addition to the stuff we do across the wider wing. And it sounds like because of the kind of reduced uh, disruption that these uh, prisoners might otherwise be causing, it's, it, that kind of, yeah. it looks after itself effectively. But the, the landing that we're on was, had been mothballed, so it, that was getting refurbished anyway, and it was just a question of, can we have that landing? And the governor at the time said, yes. So the prisoners that we've got would have been in Pentonville anyway. So it hasn't cost us any more money for, for, to have the, the unit. I'm going to open up to questions from the audience. I'm going to go there, there, and then there. Thank you very much. That was a fantastic case study. Um, I'm Hilary, Hilary Robertson from Soprasteria. The founder of our company in the UK is a big, Dame Steve Shirley is a big philanthropist in, in autism. Um, what I'm wondering is, are you looking at what happens to these people when they go back out into society? It's, prob it's probably not your role, but it's something that I think is, would be really interesting to hear about. Thank you. Okay. Great, and then uh, gentleman row in front of you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Fabian Chessel. Again, congratulations on a fantastic initiative. The essence of productivity, better outcomes with the same resources. Uh, I'm interested in the question of how easy or tough we've made that. We've talk, heard about barriers earlier today. Did we, or did uh, government or bodies put any restrictions on you? Did you have the empowerment policies, procedures you need? Can you talk a little bit about that for us, please? Yeah. Perfect. Uh, then I think there's a gentleman over there. Um, thanks. I'm Nick Campsey. I'm a, a non-exec at the uh, at HMPPS. Um, sort of had heard sort of whispers of this. Delighted to get more. My question is, you attach this to the neurodiverse community. Hearing you describe it sounds to me actually just a, what we should be doing for all prisons, in all prisoners. You're doing it with neuro, neurodiverse um, prisoners, am I right in that? Is there any bright line in terms of the positive impact with the cohort that you're dealing with, or are you actually just a model of what we should be doing everywhere across the estate? Thank you. Uh, let's just take those um, three for now. So, should we just be doing this anyway? Is this just not kind of what standard good practice sh should look like? Um, to what extent did government make this easier or harder uh, for you to do? And are you tracking the kind of the outcomes of those who've passed through the wing? Um, for the first one, yes, absolutely. I think from a healthcare perspective, that is the NHS England agenda, because what we're doing is trauma-informed care, which we know is something that NHS England is interested in rolling out in whatever setting we work in, in forensic mental health. So community, secure units, prisons, and prisons have been last to sort of come on board with that agenda. And then the male remand prisons, I think, get the least attention and resource. So yeah, absolutely. We're thinking about how we replicate it across all of Pentonville, not just G1, but it should be happening everywhere, I agree. We're also trying to, when they get, if the prisoner gets transferred, um, we send a file with them um, which has all their information, what they've been diagnosed with, what we're, we're helping them with, so they don't have to start again at the next prison. And in terms of the tracking, have you been able to kind of follow people at all afterwards, after they've left? No, very rarely. I think we are in touch with, or trying to be in touch with HMPPS evidence-based team to look at doing a bigger piece of research. Because the, the initial data we have is quite small numbers and some of it is qualitative, but we're hoping we'll get more resource for a bigger project that does a longer term follow up. And then the final one, to what extent were you kind of supported or it, like your life was made harder by some of the kind of the rules and regulations coming from above? Um, we were lucky that our governor at the time, Ian Blakeman, he's just become the, the, the um, regional director of London. He, he was our number one and he was so supportive of it um, and he's I think, I think if there were any barriers or were any restrictions he 
just moved them over. I don't think we've had any. If anything, it's gone the other way. People are, the amount of people I have, or we have, coming to visit um, is astonishing. Got the BBC tomorrow. <laughs> so you heard it here before the BBC. Um, I think we've probably got time for one or two additional questions. Uh, let's go here and here. Thank you. It's really amazing to hear about this initiative. I'm Rose Cowley. I currently work for CPS. Um, I guess a question I had, you talked yourself about how uh, unfamiliar you were with neurotypical conditions, and I think we all know there's mental health stigma still in the society and against those who have neurotypical, neurodiverse conditions, apologies. I guess, did you face any cultural barriers in terms of, I saw you asked officers to for, volunteer, for example, for additional training. Did you see any kind of cultural barriers to adopting this approach? Thank you, and, and then we'll find a question on the front. Thank you. Um, Emma Hazen, Hampton Trust. <laughs> um, I'm sort of a similar vein, but I'm just interested to know um, what the impact was in general for the staff of this change, if it led to staff retention or um, positive feedback, that sort of thing. Okay. Great. So two questions there. One on kind of any cultural barriers um, for the staff, and then uh, has it helped with kind of other staff issues like retention? Do you want me to do it? I think that the biggest one was that the staff without belittling what prison officers do. We, we basically are a whole list of different types of jobs we have to do. And one of them is, is looking after the prisoners and their, their welfare and, and treating them decently. But when you're two officers and you're on a landing of 80 prisoners, that's not happening. And you can be as nice as part of them, but if you, you, you can't get them out for a shower and that kind of thing, and that's what creates a lot of trouble. The, the, the good thing I've got with the, the staff that, that I didn't actually hand pick, but I've got, I've had a, a, a say in who I have. Every single one of them cares about what, what's happening to the staff, uh, what's happening to the prisoners. To say, to go on to the, the other thing, the staff, it was like a, when we first started, it, it was like a, I don't know, they didn't really understand what was going on because we had, it's when you're on a, a landing with one of these guys, you know that you can, what you have to do. When you've got 40 of them <laughs> and they're all clamoring for your attention, um, that did get, that was hard work. That, that was um, for the guys. Thankfully, I, they all, they, they're all, I don't think anyone's left. Uh, no, uh, anyone, of my, the retention is, 100% at the moment, I think. Um, I think we've only lost staff who have been promoted, promoted and then yeah. moved on to other wings, and we hope that it means that they're taking the ethos and that way of working onto mainstream wings. But officers, it's, it's quite tiring emotionally. It's not the job they sign up for. Um, they don't sign up to become sort of therapeutic parents as well as prison officers. So I think there's, there's a moral injury that can be experienced with that when you're having to restrain someone who you've then learned a lot about in terms of their background and their vulnerabilities. Whereas on, on a main landing, you wouldn't know very much about what someone's been through in life or what their needs are. I think that, So you can be a bit more detached. But one of the good things is we have a video that we, we can't show you now, but we've got a video. And one of the things that's said on the video by one of the, the members of staff, she was the SO at the time, is she knows, or the staff that are on there know when their birthdays are, what their first names are, what makes them tick, what annoys them. You don't have that on the normal wings, whereas down on G1, they do. So um, when new guys come down, they're all welcomed. They're, they're given a um, all fresh kit, fresh bedding. The cells are all immaculate, apart from a couple that won't let us tidy them up and clean them, but we'll, <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's all, the, the, and going on to what you said about the people, uh, the, the other services, the CPS, the courts, probation, they've got to switch on and get into that. We get people that come through the door. We had one who was non-verbal autistic three weeks ago, four weeks ago, non-verbal autistic, got restrained in reception because he was, wasn't speaking to them, came down to us the next day. He was in for not paying his um, train ticket but they couldn't put him anywhere because there was no hospital to put him in. They did, so he came to prison. 
So we're dealing with that on a regular basis. Thank you. Um, well, that, um, let's, uh, a round of applause for that final presentation. <laughs> After those three fantastic presentations, I'm now going to uh, welcome to the stage uh, Bart Van Ark uh, from the Productivity Institute for some kind of final reflections. <laughs> Bart, I'm going to come to you. Any kind of initial thoughts based on what you've heard tonight and kind of common themes and lessons we can draw about kind of how to drive productivity improvements more widely across the public sector? So, so let me first of all say the reason why we as Productivity Institute partnered with you, Institute for Government, is because we really wanted to get out these use cases here. And kudos to you as an organization, but also for our speakers here this evening to actually do that, to bring some really good cases around productivity in the public sector, in this case, in the law enforcement criminal justice system. And, you know, if you're working on productivity at a very high level every day, it, you know, you, you need some modesty when I hear these stories and see what you're actually doing on the ground. And it deserves a lot of respect. Uh, I had to associate a little bit with the therapy dogs because my wife has been doing it for 10 years in the US. And I could see how you can actually achieve better outcomes with relatively small means. So it was a, was a good story to hear. Having said that, though, when we talk about productivity, I want to say one or two things just to reflect a little bit. So, Productivity in the public sector is very much about outcomes and about resources. We heard a lot about outcomes tonight. We heard somewhat about resources, and one time I probed a little bit on the resources question. Uh, but ultimately, we need to think about those too. And we, we, you know, we want to get these out, uh, better outcomes. I so totally and totally can convince that if we get better outcomes, we save a lot of resources down the road. But at the same time, we're dealing with the people in Whitehall who are telling us, look, this budget for the public sector is going up and up and up, and we need to sort of begin to slow that down, and how can we do that? So I would encourage everyone, as important as the outcomes are, the resource element, and I'm sure you confronted with that every day, is, it really matters, and I think we need to, need to address that. But just on that, just yeah. to say, so we're currently doing a bit of research on prevention and how you can drive that more widely. And one of the big problems is that when you invest in prevention, that the benefits often accrue elsewhere. Yeah. And therefore, how you convince the people who have the money to invest in it when they're unlikely to see the benefits yeah. uh, in their budget line. Yeah, actually, that's a really nice segue. And the second thing I wanted to say, because the nice thing is that we got some different stories here for of people working in sort of the entire chain, police and you know, uh, follow up in the police for CARA, prisons. Uh, and indeed, you can get benefits in other parts of the sector when you begin to do that. What we were missing tonight were courts. We were trying to get the courts. <laughs> and I wonder what's happening to productivity in courts, because it's actually an important part of the chain here. And I wonder if there's somebody in the room or online who knows, I know a good example, a case in courts, we would love to hear it, because we couldn't find one. So I think that is something we need to think about as well. Now, drivers of productivity improvement in the public sector, I think it's about a couple of things that we heard things about. I just wanted to stress that a little bit. So first of all, it's about joining up resources. So it's very much about, you know, you have a technology, you have a tool, you have a potential method of improving your results, but you then suddenly realize that there's a lot more you need to change in the organization. You need to change skills, you need to change attitude, uh, you need to have organizational change, all those kind of things. That joining up is really important, and we heard some of that uh, tonight, and I hope that in going forward we do hear a bit more of that too. Scaling up is the other <coughs> important source, and I really, I really was happy to hear a lot about the attempts to scale up. Also, the barriers around that, which are very clear, and I think that is one of the struggles we have in the public sector, that it is very difficult to scale these things up because every organization is different. The question about the 43 forces in the police is obviously one. How do you scale that up from one or two forces to more? And I think that is, that is a, a critical thing because we, we really think about scale across this, what we call the delivery chain. So you want to have scale in the outcomes. You want to have scale in the resources you're using because if you share resources among more uh, parts of the organization, that will give you productivity gains. And what we didn't hear much about, but very important, is the, uh, the gains that you, efficiency gains you can make at the front end on the budget side. So the procurement and improving in procurement. One reason you want to go up to scaling up uh, the 43 forces in the police is because procurement will significantly improve. It's crazy to do all that procurement at lower levels. So the scaling up is very important. And then the third really important thing is collaboration and communication. 
um, you know, it's clear from all the case studies that we've heard is that that sort of collaboration and communicating the results and being very transparent around that is, is really important. Just one final uh, reflection I had then, it seemed that kind of the importance of leadership uh, yeah. in all of these, whether it was kind of, uh, whether it was having the sort of bravery to implement and do something new in the first place or uh, being able to kind of protect uh, resources in order to do something, is, is that something you've seen kind of more broadly about the importance of leadership? And if so, kind yeah. of how do you, how do you bottle that magic yeah. uh, when it's yeah. kind of within individuals? Yeah, you know, leadership is one of those terms that we throw it around, and it, it is really, really important. But the, the word that we heard tonight, I think in all the three cases, is culture. Uh, and that really is driven not just by the leaders. The leaders are instrumental to that, but it's also sort of an organization beginning to understand what their common purpose is going to be and how they can literally achieve better results. So. An innovation culture is a culture that you want to change things and you want to improve things, and you want to collaborate in. And I think one thing that came out, again, in quite a few of the presentations, very explicit in Matt's first presentation, is sort of the issue of the resistance to change, which quite often is on a very rational basis based on fear. You, you use the word fear, I think, Matt. Uh, personal fear or institutionalized fear. And it's understandable in a public organization where you're under high public scrutiny that you are cautious because before you know it's going to be exposed and you're going to be in trouble and whatever. But it really makes it hard to create an experimental culture in which you sometimes also fail, right? So I think it's very important for public sector organizations to try and create an environment in which we can innovate and experiment and fail and learn from lessons. I really, uh, one of you was talking about the fact that we try to really get feedback in order to improve and evaluate. And I think that it, those are the critical elements of leadership that we need to bring into those organizations. And it obviously starts with senior people, but it needs to go into the rest of the organization. And I think getting that fear out of the system one way or another is absolutely critical. Uh, go on, yeah, we'll take, uh, we had a question down here. Just, uh, if you could wait to the microphone to come. I'd just like to follow up on the leadership point because it's not just a matter of one leader, it's a matter of an integration of people at different levels. Chantal Hughes developed this program with incredible leadership that was supported by Scott Chilton as a superintendent who is now the chief constable of Hampshire. And at the time, the chief constable was Andy Marsh, who is now the head of the College of Policing. So it's just a combination of really outstanding people who were able to deliver CARA with the added advantage of a randomized trial. Um, and the same thing can be said about rapid video response in Kent, where Stacy Rothwell, uh, as a master's student, was clearly driving this thing, uh, virtually sleeping on the floor to make sure the video responses got out. Uh, but with the full support of Alan Pusley, who is now uh, chairing the uh, uh, Police Productivity Committee. So, so I'd like to think in terms of coalitions of leadership, uh, which Heather Strang has written about, as opposed to any one magic hero, the Absolutely. Napoleon who comes along and makes it all happen. And if we promoted coalitions, people could say to each other, hey, you want to join my coalition? So, thank you. Great. And just one more comment or question behind. Thank you. Um, uh, but I'd like to gently challenge a little bit your point around scaling. The sort of bigger is better mentality. We heard it with the forces question. Uh, I say that for a few reasons. You brought up procurement. I think if we look at some of the national contracts, they're often the ones that people complain about most. If we talk about forces, what's the biggest force in the UK? It's the Met Police. And I'm not sure that's a performance that we would aspire to. Mm. And if we look at the wonderful work that Cara did, um, uh, the, the car I did, it was, uh, you know, the challenge came when they had to seek permission from Ministry of Justice, the national permission giver. You know, it was allowed to happen because within the force, there was the empowerment to make their own decision. So I just want to sort of gently ask you that question around, is bigger always better? No. Should we be looking to make these national systems with national policies, with national policy makers? Because that's sometimes it's where it go, uh, the conversation right. goes. Yeah, yeah, seconds. Very quickly, <laughs> yes. No, big is not always better, full stop. So that would be the simple answer. Scaling up does matter for productivity. I'm sorry, but it is clear for all the studies that if we can scale up, we can use resources in a more efficient way to get better outcomes. But there is a balance to be found, and that balance is very difficult to get. So how far do we want to scale up? So I need to get convinced that 43 forces is the right scale. 
Um, if somebody can convince me of that, I'm happy to take. I don't think it is. And I think there are many other examples where I think my balance would go to the fact that there's more opportunity to scale up rather than to scale down. But Brilliant. big is not always better, for sure. Brilliant. On that note, I'm going to bring the event to a close. Um, as I mentioned at the start, this is the second in a new quarterly series. Uh, the third event is scheduled to take place on the 23rd of May and will focus on examples in the health and care sector. Uh, until then, I'd like to thank all of our speakers, uh, to thank the Productivity Institute for supporting and partnering with us on Productivity Pitches, and thank you to all those who've watched today or listened back later on SoundCloud and YouTube. Thank you. Thank you.